Okay. Be up here. There you go. Right, you know right. how to step through, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Greg. Sure. Thank you very much, and I appreciate very much being able to be here to share with you some uh, thoughts concerning the NGSS and its proper, and its possible, rather, implementation within the uh, 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 educational uh, community in the state of California. What I'm going to share with you today is just some very brief ideas that are uh, presented along with the NGSS, uh, helping describe what its philosophy and purpose is. And um, much of this material you can get by just reading the front matter and all of the front matter and all of the appendices as well as the DCIs, the uh, discipline core ideas and so forth, can be found at this particular website. So if you just go to uh, www.nextscience or nextgenscience.org, you'll be able to get the information. So let's begin. Uh, the NGSS design considerations. Uh, in putting the vision of the framework into practice, the NGSS has been written as performance expectations that depict what the student must do to show proficiency in science. This is a minimum set of goals uh, for the student. This does not suggest it's exclusive, uh, but rather that there can be more that the student can do to show uh, their proficiency in science. Science and engineering practices were coupled with various components of the disciplinary core ideas and cross-cutting concepts to make up the performance expectations. And we'll take a look at one of them as we go through this. Uh, coupling practice with content, it's important to note that the scientific and engineering practices are not teaching strategies. Uh, they are indicators of achievement as well as important learning goals in their own right. Uh, as such, the framework and NGSS ensure the practices are not treated as afterthoughts. Coupling practice with content gives the learning context. And so we understand that the way that most students learn is that they learn in context of whatever the subject they're discussing. And practices alone are simply activities and content alone is simply memorization. Uh, the NGSS are standards and not curriculum. We need to be uh, understanding what that means. I know that's a struggle for a lot of us since we have been embedded uh, with standards from before and we have talked to the standards, so to speak, and making sure that the students understand the standards. But these standards are not curriculum. Uh, they are goals that reflect what a student should know and be able to do after instruction. And as I have already indicated, they are minimum goals. In other words, uh, the student can learn more. You're not restricted in what you teach the student about that particular subject. It's just that they are able to do this particular activity as part of that instruction. They do not dictate the manner or methods by which the standards are taught. Uh, the performance expectations are written in a way that expresses the concept and skills to be performed, but still leaves curricular and instructional decisions to states and districts, schools, and teachers. Uh, the instructional flexibility, students should be evaluated based on understanding a full disciplinary core idea. Multiple scientific and engineering practices are represented across the performance expectations for a given disciplinary core idea. Uh, curriculum and assessment must be developed in a way that builds student knowledge and ability toward the performance expectations. So those of you involved with uh, curricular design and assessment activities need to understand that there is a foundation of, of information and material that the student needs to grasp before they can even uh, think about achieving that particular performance expectation. Why NGSS? Uh, the purpose behind it was the U.S. has a leaky, what we call K-12 science, STEM, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or STEM talent pipeline, with too few students entering STEM majors and careers at every level, from those with relevant post-secondary certificates to PhDs. So it was developed because we believe that there are new science standards needed that stimulate and build interest in STEM. Uh, implementing the NGSS will better prepare high school graduates for the rigors of college and careers. 
In turn, employers will be able to hire workers with strong science-based skills, not only in specific content areas, but also with skills such as critical thinking and inquiry-based problem solving. Uh, the framework itself from which the NGSS were formed uh, describes the following in three dimensions. It outlines three dimensions that are needed to provide students a high quality science education. And the integration of these three dimensions provides students with a context for the context of science. How science knowledge is acquired and understood and how the sciences are connected through concepts that have universal meaning across the disciplines. The first dimension is practices. And uh, dimension one describes the major practices that scientists employ as they investigate and build models and theories around the world. And B, a key set of engineering practices that engineers use as they design and build system. The second dimension is called cross-cutting concepts. And the cross-cutting concepts have application across all domains of science. As such, they provide one way of linking across uh, the different domains that are going to be revealed in uh, Dimension 3. And in Dimension 3, we have what we call the DCI, or the Disciplinary Core Ideas. An important role of science education is not to teach all the facts, but rather to prepare students with sufficient core knowledge so that they can later acquire additional information on their own. An education focused on a limited set of ideas and practices in science and engineering should enable students to evaluate and select reliable sources of scientific information and allow them to continue their, their development well beyond their K-12 school years as science learners, users of scientific knowledge, and perhaps also as producers of such knowledge. Although not every core idea will satisfy every one of the, uh, these criteria, I wanted to just briefly share with you the reasoning behind the specific ideas of why they were chosen. Uh, there were four criteria that were used to determine if a, an idea was a core idea. And each idea must meet at least two of them. Specifically, a core idea for K-12 science uh, instruction should include one, have a broad importance across multiple sciences or engineering disciplines or be a key organizing principle of a, key, a single discipline. Two, provide a key tool for understanding or investigating more complex ideas and solving problems. Three, uh, relate to the interests and life experiences of the students to be or be connected to societal and personal concerns that require scientific or technological knowledge. And four, be teachable and learnable over multiple grades at increasing levels of depth and sophistication. That is, the idea can be made accessible to younger students, but is broad enough to sustain continued investigation over the years. An example of this is the uh, NGSS standard for uh, Earth, space and, Earth and Space Sciences, Earth Place in the Universe for the fifth grade where there were two uh, specific performance expectations listed. Support an argument that differences in apparent brightness of the sun compared to other stars is due to their relative distances from the Earth. And number two, represent data and graphical displays to reveal patterns of daily changes in length and direction of shadows and day and night and the seasonal appearance of some stars in the night sky. I might note that the key uh, point of these performance expectations are taken from the disciplinary core ideas, which is from the framework, which is right here. And uh, this is an example of where not all the information is given at once, but instead that there are foundational principles that are laid and that these particular topics that are mentioned in the expectations up here will actually be developed as you move to higher level grades up through the 12th grade. So. Uh, that's one of the reasons they're written the way they are. You will also note, if you note the, what is called the assessment boundaries, the idea being for the assessment boundary is that the teacher recognized that, you know, when we're talking about why stars have different brightness, we don't have to get involved with the ideas of the size of the star and the temperature of the star and, and things like that. What we're really concerned about at this level in the fifth grade is that they understand that a star of the same brightness as the sun 
can appear fainter if it's further away. That's the key idea, you see. Now, if you're an astronomer and you come at this and you look at this and you say, wait a second, that's not true. You know, they're leaving out all these other things. That's not true. At least that's how I felt when I read it and I looked at it. And I began to realize, you know, they're talking about a learning progression. And you can't unload everything in the fifth grade, you know, on a student and expect them to understand what's going on. Instead, you have to pick and choose, okay, what is the progression of learning that the student is going through and what do they need now at the fifth grade? And so this is what was determined. And you'll also see that there are the connecting science and engineering practices on one side as well as the cross-cutting concepts on the other in um, achieving this particular uh, uh, goal. The DCI itself, the disciplinary core ideas, are organized into four domains which represent four different uh, science groups, the physical sciences, the life sciences, the earth and space sciences, and engineering technology and applications of science. At the same time, true to dimension two, we acknowledge the multiple uh, connections between the domains. Now, I want to just share with you a couple of appendices. I, they're, they're more detailed than what I'm going to share with you, but I just want to show you the main ideas and help you, or her, perhaps stimulate you in taking a look at them for yourselves so that you have a, a better grasp of uh, what is uh, being discussed here with NGSS. Appendix A are conceptual shifts, and these conceptual shifts came about as a result of a public input back in April, uh, March and April. The NGSS provide an important opportunity to improve not only science education, but also student achievement. Based on the framework for K-12 science education, the NGSS are intended to reflect a new vision for American science education. The lead states and writing teams have identified seven conceptual shifts science educators and stakeholders need to make to effectively use the NGSS. And these are those conceptual shifts that you will find in Appendix A. One, K-12 science education should reflect the real world interconnections in science. And so this was one of the key things that was the, uh, reviewed in determining the core ideas, and that is what are the, uh, the real world activities and experiences that the student actually goes through in order to teach that particular science concept. Two, the next generation science standards are student outcomes and are explicitly not curriculum. Three, science concepts build coherently across K-12. Four, the NGSS focus on deeper understanding and application of content. Five, science and engineering are integrated in science education from K-12. Six, the NGSS are designed to prepare students for college, career, and citizenship. And seven, science standards coordinate with the English language arts and mathematics common core state standards, uh, which will be discussed by Jackie in just a moment. In Appendix E, uh, I just share this with you to show that uh, there is a connection from K through 12 for, uh, for all of the different disciplinary core ideas. Uh, they have been developed, the NGSS have been developed in learning progressions based on progressions identified by the grade band endpoints in the framework. Short narrative descriptions of the progressions are presented for each disciplinary core idea in each of the traditional sciences. And these progressions were used in the college and career readiness review to determine the learning expected for each idea before leaving high school and entering college. So the college teacher will know what kind of training and education have the students had in this particular area? Uh, this is part of that appendix C, and you will see up here uh, the universe and its stars, and Earth and the solar system, ESS 1A, ESS 1B, and starting with kindergarten here, it talks about the patterns of movement, the sun, uh, moon, and stars, and so forth. Moving this direction, it focuses on the Earth and the solar system down here. Up there, it's more general, speaking of galaxies and stars. And then in the 12th, 9th and 12th grade over here, you get into more specific detail uh, about those particular ideas. So anyway, I appreciate very much your kind attention, and I'm going to turn this over to Jackie. We could take maybe one question for Glenn while I'm transitioning here. Anyone want? Beth? I've written to see what you think about this one. As the state 
standards progress through grades, K through 12, it scaffolds the order in which ideas could, should, be presented at the college level. What's your reaction to that? Um, I think that the uh, if I understand what you're saying, is that the, the manner or way in which the ideas are presented are scaffolded, by the time we reach college, are we suggesting that uh, they would be reviewed in that same order? I'm suggesting my students do not have these scaffolds. Oh, okay. So, so you're talking about people now. I know you're saying it's not curriculum, it's not curriculum. Right. But when I come to my students, I'm suggesting this could be the order in which ideas should be presented. Yes. Yes. I, I think so. I, I, like I said, there's a learning progression that takes place. And so it's being a college teacher myself, I a lot of times uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to be more interactive with the students and making sure that they're coming out of that I'm I'm hearing what they have to learn or, or what they know rather than letting them know everything I know. You know because that, that doesn't do any learning on their part. And so uh, I think what happens a lot of times I have to allow the student to progress through that scaffold themselves before they come to an aha and say, okay, that's that's what this means. Now I see a connection over here. Which I already saw, but it's it's not good for me to tell them what it does. They need to discover that. So that I think what you're saying. And that would be a, a good learning progression. All right, thank you. Next, let's move on to Jackie Barber, who currently serves as an associate director for the, at the Lawrence Hall of Science at UC Berkeley, and she's responsible for the Hall's Curriculum Center. Uh, she is the founding director of the successful Great Explorations in Math and Science, or GEMS program, which many of you may be familiar with. Uh, the GEMS is a collection of over... Thank you, I'm happy to be here. So I love this quote. And also, it captures the substance of my comments today. I'm going to focus my comments on the expanded view of science that's been embraced by the NGSS and the NRC framework that underlies it. Um, existing state standards and even the National Science Education Standards came out in 96, really focused on um, inquiry as the science practice and inquiry as a way of finding out. The NGSS acknowledged that certainly inquiry plays a central role in uh, what scientists do, um, but it also acknowledges the importance of social construction of knowledge, um, how we talk about and negotiate meaning in science. Um, it's all about that in a way. It's not just understanding that something is there, but being able to understand how we know that and to be able to engage in discourse with someone else about it. And indeed, that models how science knowledge is developed. So what does it mean to talk about planets and stars? It means a lot of things, and there are many ways that scientists talk with each other about the natural world, some through actual talk, as well as other ways of communicating um, discourse and argumentation, et cetera. The NGSS um, have captured in uh, practices, science practices six, seven, and eight, so three practices out of eight, really focus in on um, how kids construct explanations, engaging in argument from evidence, and obtaining, evaluating, and communicating information. Um, so these, this, is, this is a big deal, that more than a third of the science practices emphasized in the NGSS relate to talking and communicating and um, uh, engaging with others. So, um, in the past 10 years or so, uh, the, the term disciplinary literacy has been coined. And by that, we mean the literacy skills you need to be successful in a particular discipline. Um, and it, it, when we assume that kids know how to read science text or how to engage in science talk or, or write science text, we're really failing uh, to prepare them to be proficient in science. And I don't know, raise your hand if you've 
if you're familiar with the reading between the lines study that ACT did. Yeah, a couple people. It, it really is a dramatic, uh, provides dramatic evidence of this. Um, and basically the conclusion uh, is of their study, which was very large because they have all this data, all the kids who take the ACT test, they can look at, look at what their scores are um, and what their scores are in different disciplines and is there a relationship. And basically, um, the kind of reading that students have a hard time doing, students who take the ACT, that's not even all students, those are college bound students who are taking the ACT test, they, um, they do okay on uh, simpler reading comprehension, but when it gets to informational text, complex informational text, and needing to make uh, inferences from that, that's where students aren't doing well on the ACT. And if you look at the number of students who do well on the science ACT, um, you'll f first of all, you'll find out that it's less than half of students. Um, and if you look at who are these students who are doing well on uh, the science part of the ACT, well, all but 5% of those students also do very well on, in reading complex informational text. So being able to read in the discipline is one of the main ways that we learn and we communicate increasingly over the, over, as the grades go on. Um, so you might have gotten by in elementary school or middle school if you're not, a, you're not able to read complex text. Um, you may have gotten by with science, but it diverges over time that that's something we need to be able to do to read complex text. And um, the Shanahan's, um, uh, Tim and Cindy Shanahan have done some really wonderful work looking at um, disciplinary literacy. One of the things they did is they followed around um, uh, a mathematician and a chemist and let's see and historian, and they tried to understand the differences in how experts in different domains approach text. And what they found out is that um, a chemist read text very differently from a mathematician. You know, a mathematician, in, in math, the words, as you know, um, you have to read very carefully and reread and slow, deep read. Um, some mathematicians talk about reading proofs over and over, and the word a and the, the choice of that word makes a huge difference. Whereas in science, or in this particular, they were focused on a chemist. This chemist was paying a lot of, uh, was turning the pages faster than a mathematician, going back and forth, looking at what the visual representations are, what the headings are, and trying to reconcile and get new, deeper meaning from reading by taking both the visual representation, the diagram, whatever, and the text and synthesizing that, going back and forth. And so in this case, a slow, careful reader who's reading in order isn't going to probably do as well as someone who's looking at the big picture and trying to synthesize the, the different representations of concepts that appear in there. And the historian, first thing the historian did was look um, uh, to see who wrote this and what their biases might be so they could go through and question and, and doubt it all. But this notion that we, this notion that we, um, we read differently in disciplines and we never teach kids how to do this. Um, and we aren't born knowing how to do this. Um, kids learn to read on fiction, mostly. Um, and so uh, we kind of push students off the cliff when they get to middle school. We stop teaching them how to read. We don't consider that part of the discipline. Uh, and um, the ones who figure it out do well, and the rest don't do so well. And you, that's really reflected in the ACT. 50% of kids um, aren't, uh, aren't passing, are, aren't able to read and make sense of complex text. Um, so there's a lot more, if, you, if, if you're interested to dive into this disciplinary literacy, David Pearson, Elizabeth Moji, Cynthia Greenleaf, um, uh, uh, an article in Science Magazine that they did put 
together, I think it was fall 2010, is really, really interesting. Um, and this underlies the emphases that we see in the NGSS. That's why three of the eight practices are focused on these disciplinary literacy practices. And we might call them literacy practices, but the NGSS actually call them science practices. They're what you need to do to be successful in science. Um, a very cool thing about uh, the, this Common Core Standards movement, which includes the Common Core Standards for English Language Arts, as well as the Common Core Standards for Mathematics and the NGSS, all part of a similar movement, also recognize um, the importance of giving students experience and explicit instruction in how you read text in discipline, in the disciplines, um, and they've really um, uh, have have made recommendations for how much time students should spend reading informational text. And I think it's a 50/50 recommendation, and really emphasizing that literacy does not mean literature. So there's this entire section. Um, focused, there are two sections, there's one on uh, for history and social studies, um, but there's a whole section on literacy in science and technical subjects. Right, uh, raise your hand if you've seen this visual rep. Okay, uh, Tina Chuck, who works with the uh, Understanding Language Project at Stanford put this together, and there's another couple of versions that go out there, and this is looking at all of the practices that are um, <clears throat> in the Common Core Standards for Math and ELA and the Next Generation Science Standards. And you can see, um, this isn't an accident. There was um, an effort to coordinate between the, the various standards development. NGSS came last, and so they um, you know, had the benefit of seeing where the emphasis was. Um, this provides a wonderful focusing function for educators. Um, and as we work to move education forward in a more cohesive and coherent way, um, you can see where the bullseye is here. Those practices that are important across disciplines. Glenn mentioned different appendices. Um, my favorite is Appendix M. <laughs> and it really goes in very deeply into the connections to the Common Core State Standards uh, in Literacy. Um, in science and technical subjects and the NGSS. So again, um, a lot of uh, consonants there. Kids are going to be getting the same message in different courses and different classes. So what does this look like in a classroom? What does it look like to talk about the moon and planets and moons? Um, first of all, we just have to make opportunities for student-to-student -student talk. Um, we need to figure out ways to incorporate routines that allow students to negotiate meaning themselves, um, not us explaining the meaning to them always. Uh, we need, as teachers, to model what that looks like, to do think aloud and show, here's how I approach reading this text, or, um, and scaffolding students' participation, giving sentence starters um, in the, some of the elementary curriculum that we create now, we give kids um, uh, little frames that they can use that are useful, like my evidence is, or I think this because, or why do you think that, what's your evidence, those kinds of things. And very quickly, if they're used consistently, you start hearing that as a refrain in the classroom. Um, but you're not born knowing that. That has to be something that we instruct kids to do in the, in the discipline of science. And finally, this providing low stakes opportunities for practice. Um, we often have, you can, uh, in standard education, kids will have a chance to make a presentation in front of the whole class. Um, that's nervous making, that's high stakes. We need opportunities for kids to practice using language and talking with each other and and doing that without the kind of additional pressure there. So really quickly, two last slides. Um, I don't know who saw the July issues of both the science teacher, which is the 
<clears throat> National Science Teachers Association Journal for High School Teachers and Science Scope for Middle School Teachers, but they both feature discourse and argumentation. Um, <clears throat> I had been reading the Science Scope one, and some of my team have an article in there, and Glenn sent us the, the, the high school one. I'm like, oh, it's great. And they're really filled with wonderful ideas um, that anyone can use, uh, whether you're a, a, a developer of curriculum, uh, someone who works with teachers, someone who works with kids, uh, to really promote uh, discourse and argumentation in the classroom. And um, uh, dis full disclosure here, this is a program that I developed um, called Seeds of Science Roots of Reading. Um, but um, what I want to mention to you is a free resource we have, um, which shows teachers how to use a successful strategy that we've used called discourse circles, where we scaffold for second, third, fourth, fifth graders how you talk to each other in an evidence-based way. What do you say first? How might you react, etc.? And giving kids lots of practice in these four student discourse um, circles to do this kind of negotiation of meaning and to start to not just learn what, um, but to be able to say how we know. So, um, website, science and learning, uh, oh, scienceandliteracy.org, and it's called Strategy Guides. We have 81 free strategy guides that all feature disciplinary literacy strategies you can do in an elementary classroom. This particular one is um, with a great book we have called What About Pluto, which um, is a great book. So um, I'm going to stop there and uh, pass it over. Is there one question for Jackie while we transition? <laughs> Give people a moment. Yep. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. All right, next, <clears throat> Rick Pomeroy has a degree in molecular biology that, uh, from UC San Diego before beginning his teaching career. He taught all science disciplines at the middle school and high school levels for 20 years before joining the faculty of the UC Davis School of Education. He earned his PhD in science education in 2000 and has specialized in secondary level science education for the past 20 years. He is the immediate past president of the California Science Teachers Association, which I served on the board, the same uh, overlapping with him for four years. Um, he is a member of the California State NGSS -S, NGSS uh, adoption team, the science expert panel, and other committees charged with the review and evaluation of the NGSS. Um, Rick has presented institutes and workshops on engaging university faculty in, in inquiry instruction in large lecture courses 
presented to regional, national, and inter international audiences on the topics of science education and working with English language learners. And he's currently the director of the UC Davis Science Teacher Credential Program and the UC Davis Young Scholars Program. Please welcome Rick Pomeroy. Don't turn it on yet. Don't turn it on yet. You look I want to know where you found all that information, Greg, because I, I don't know that guy. So, <laughs> so I'm going to sort of play a little technology here and see if I can make this work. And Let me know when you want me to. Okay, we've got to wait for everything to warm up. It's not warm enough yet. My students always tell me that I can't teach without PowerPoint. And so I was going to just leave it black and talk for a while. <laughs> and um, that would have worked. How many of you have actually looked at the standards and gone through all those colored pages? Okay. Any additional people have looked at the framework? OK, good. How many people from California? OK, so I'm a kind of California-centric kind of person. All of my experience has really been through working through a lot of these issues in California. Um, but they all apply to the national scene as well. And so I decided to take a slightly different approach to what I'm going to show you in the sense that I don't want to use a lot of words because you've seen a lot of words and you saw Glenn graciously, you know, was my foil. He showed us the, the page that had all those colors on it and all that text. And probably the thing that is daunting to most people when they first look at NGSS is, oh my God, this is so text dense, I don't know if I'm ever going to get through that. So I'm going to try and do a, 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 a non-text centric pre presentation. So we're here about implementation, and so I do not have a crystal ball for the future. I can tell you a little bit about the scenario that we're going to be working through, and we can talk a little bit more about it. And I know you're interested in implementation because much of the work that you do will be involved with that. So I took a very simple approach. Like I said, I wanted to use very few words. So we're going to look at sort of who, what, where, when, why, and we'll throw in a little bit of how about implementation of NGSS. And then finally, we're going to look at, hopefully, a few of the challenges. Because in the end, implementation is going to happen in some way. It's how we deal with the challenges that really will make a difference for us. So let's start with who. These are the teachers in the United States that teach science. Uh, I like paper dolls, and so I thought that the paper doll analogy worked well. There are two million teachers of science in the United States. That's according to NSCA. If you're from California, like I said, there are roughly 300,000 teachers. Of those, 220,000 people teach or should be teaching some form of science. We'll come back to why that's a challenge at the other end. All right, so the what. What is it that we're talking about? What are we really concerned about? What are we trying to implement? Well, we're trying to implement the next generation of science standards, which really, the important piece is, we have three pieces. We've got the science and engineering practices, the cross-cutting ideas, and the disciplinary core ideas. As you're going to see as we go along, only one of these really, I believe, presents a significant challenge to us. The others are things that we should be able to handle. Cross-cutting ideas, we all kind of know that energy exists in biology and chemistry and physics and in earth and space science. That's a cross-cutting idea. We all understand that scale of objects applies across a lot of things, from mitochondria to Jupiter. We all can learn the content in some way. But it's the, it's the science and engineering practices that really present sort of our biggest problem with implementation. The other thing is NGSS is not somebody's harebrained idea of let's write some new standards and get kids involved. It's based on some very well accepted literature that we've worked with since the middle 90s. Next, uh, National Science Education Standards came out in 96. And that was about the last time that we saw any motion, any movement at all in what the standards look like. As Jackie was saying, NSES was pretty inquiry-based, which was great if you weren't from California. If you're from California, we have gold standards. Same for Nevada. And those gold standards say that you will know certain science facts. You will be able to use the periodic table at the second grade. And you will be able to understand that the sun is a star 
And you can regurgitate that on a multiple choice exam. So in California, we are really happy that something new is coming down the road. It's also not just based on people's ideas of what we ought to think about. There's been a lot of work that has gone into these standards and will be part of our implementation process that the standards are based on the research about learning and knowledge that's been done in the last 20 years. And so there's a, a variety of books. I did have to stick in some words because I stole somebody else's slide. Oh, before I go any further, I'd like to credit Google Image Search for all of my pictures. <laughs> I don't want to come get in any trouble. Or the California Department of Education, or in some cases, Achieve, gave me a couple of things. But um, the point is, this is a well thought out, well constructed set of what every student should know. Some students may need more. And you may feel that your particular area of interest isn't well represented in the standards. And go ahead and teach that. It's really important. And implementation gets away from this notion that this is all we are going to do. We have to learn how we're going to do as much as we want. So Stephen Pruitt from NGSS and Achieve said, it's what every student needs. Some students need more, but no student needs less. And so that's kind of the approach we're taking. So let's talk a little bit. I've got to remember where I am in my notes here. Oh, where did this happen? We're to the where now. Originally, 26 lead states signed on to help develop the next generation science standards and to pilot those in some way. California is one. Nevada was never signed on. However, I, was, I did a presentation last Wednesday up in Nevada all about this, and they are right along with us. Um, there are a few states that are not. Texas is not currently signed on to participating with any or all of us. Um, and, you know, it's Texas versus the rest of us. In California, it's been, you know, for years, it's been California versus everybody else that had better stuff. And so um, this is not an uncommon experience. But what's going to happen is that states are going to begin to make a decision about what they're going to do. Currently, there are... I wrote it down. Five states that have adopted NGSS, Maryland, Kansas, Vermont, Kentucky, and Rhode Island have all passed NGSS as the new standards for their state. Uh, state Board of Education in California uh, was presented with the NGSS standards and probably will act on those in September. The chances are pretty high that they will accept California's rendition of NGSS, which is all the standards are the same a little some adjustments to some uh, middle school sequence. Uh, Nevada's in exactly the same place. So uh, they should have a decision, and they're pretty positive about where they are, and they should have a decision by some time in the early fall. So that's where this is taking place. Um, so when? That's probably the next big question. I get asked this question a lot. So when am I going to have to do this? And I often will respond with, well, why wouldn't you want to just do it now? But the point is, this is the year of adoption. 2013, they were presented in April, April 8th or 9th, is when they made the final draft public, and that's when states began to know what there was, and states were going to begin to adopt. So um, I'm looking at 2013 as the adoption year. Remember, I'm kind of California-centric. Materials development is probably the thing that has to happen next. In California, we have to, once we have a set of standards that are approved, we have to write our own state framework. And many states have curriculum guides and pacing guides and whatever they want to call them. We have to get that going because that's the way California works. And most states uh, will either adopt the framework that came out before the NGSS or they will write their own state. And those typically, once they're released and materials begin to develop, takes at least 18 months. So, we figure that we're not going to have good, solid materials on the ground for teachers to use until maybe the end, summer of 2015, because it's about 18 months to get product onto the shelves. And that could be digital. It doesn't have to be a book anymore. After that, we've got professional development. We were actually talking about this in the front row, not paying attention to Greg when he was giving his opening lecture. <laughs> and sorry about that, Greg. And uh, professional development can happen pretty quickly. Because in California and many, many places, there are teams of people who have been involved in investing and really working with these items since their inception. And so professional development opportunities don't have to be approved by the legislature. They don't have to go before some board approval. They just have to be good. 
And so if you get a good group of people, Glenn's got some people he works with, Jackie has a full team of people. Once California says yes, I bet you, you guys are ready to roll out some professional development. We're not going to wait for the materials to be published because we don't have that kind of time. And so again, I say if you're going to start thinking, start thinking now. So professional development, and that's what a lot of the EPO and the Cosmos community can be involved with as well. Professional development needs to begin. And, you know, this is kind of erroneous to say professional development will stop in August of 2015. It really should be an ongoing process, just like lawyers and doctors have to go for renewed uh, updating of their certification. Teachers should be constantly involved in professional development. Once we get there, we have assessment development. I don't know about your state, but in California, we need to assess what we're doing. And so assessment development should begin fairly soon. But you really don't want to build all of your assessments until you know what your materials are going to be, until you know what your curriculum is going to look like. So assessment development is going to begin, and, and the, the earliest that I know in California that our teachers might be assessed would be the end of the 2016 school year. Um, we're not sure. Right now we're trying to do something smart like just get rid of the state testing for the year since it's really not going to make any difference in California. This process takes a long time. And the reason is that when the publisher finally puts a test out on the table and is beginning to sell that to somebody, they have to say, this really is a reliable and valid instrument. And there are a whole bunch of different sort of strategies for testing that are being developed right now. So the development of assessments takes a while. And then finally, once all of this stuff is in place, we have implementation. I see full implementation where we're ready to go through the curriculum at any given grade level. I anticipate that that's probably going to start in the September of 2016 school year. That's when, in California, if we get this passed and approved in September, it's going to take us at least till then before we can actually say, yes, we're on board. A whole bunch of stuff, all these little colored arrows, has to go on before we get to that point. And that's where the informal field can really be of assistance. You have a slice, you have an area that you're interested in, but there's a tremendous amount that can be done to get teachers and students and pre-service teachers and in-service teachers working and thinking about these things as we move forward. So, okay. so why do we need to do this? Now, originally I put this in because I thought, why do we need new standards? Well, I think we all kind of understand that we need new standards. Um, and so I was looking at it this morning and I thought, what else can I do? What, what about this implementation is important? Well, clearly, telephones have changed over a period of time. How many people have the iPhone 5? Okay, I have the 4S, and when's the 7 or the 6 going to come out? Like next week? Okay, so we have to have an implementation plan that not only respects the process that got us here, but allows us to continue this process to the iPhone 6 or iPhone 7. As if we're going to take three years to do a full implementation of this stuff, there'll be a whole bunch of things. Pluto may get its way back into the solar system. <laughs> a whole bunch of things could happen. And so our implementation plans have to be responsive to the changes that can occur in science. That's what makes science different than history, because history is all happening and math, and, and we love literature, and you know people have written books. Once they're written, they're there. We can interpret them lots of different ways. But new things are going to come out, so our implementation has to be responsive to that. So that's why we have to have a good implementation plan. So how is this going to happen? Back to my friends. There's going to be this person. I was talking to a young lady in my office yesterday. She says, how am I going to do this? And I said, well, some people are going to just do this on their own. And she raised her hand and said, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get the books, I'm going to start studying, I'm going to start making my plan. That's great. Right. This represents maybe the department at school, or maybe a group of teachers that like to go to Starbucks in the morning and talk about what they're going to do. So implementation is going to happen on an individual basis. It's going to happen in small groups. It may happen in district-wide kind of trainings. And Anybody who's a professional development offering uh, entity is looking for these people. We want to sell professional development to districts so that we can help them move forward. It may happen at conferences like this. Uh, we'd like to think that this is at least the number of people that will be at the California Science Education Conference. 
Um, but there's an FCA, and every state has their own. So there's going to be conferences that are going to have heavy focuses. And then there are going to be MOOCs. How many people know what MOOCs are? All right, I'm involved with some people who are trying to put together a MOOC on professional development for this. Massive online MOOCs. OK. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is going to be another way that this is going to happen. We're in a digital world. We are connected in many, many different ways. So our implementation plan has to go everywhere from Megan, who was sitting in my office yesterday saying, I'm going to do this by myself, to all these MOOCs and all these people who are going to connect digitally and connect from a long distance. <laughs> so now I'm back to the challenges. And here's that slide that I showed you at the beginning. What do you notice about this? Now we're going to do a little data analysis and argumentation. What do you notice in this picture? I can walk the aisle. <laughs> Sorry, guys, but I have the clicker in my back. Anybody see anything here? Yes. Oh, one of, you know, what about it? Megan said the same thing to me yesterday. This little guy fell down. Boy, that's looking for the minutia in the big picture. Anything <laughs> else that you see? Yes. Ideas are clear to a quarter of the people on the West are working. You know, unfortunately, that may be closer to the truth than you think. Three quarters of the people who teach science are elementary school teachers. And if every elementary school teacher was teaching science as we would dream, then all of these people, ooh, my battery's going dead, all of these, oh, that's the wrong button. Look. <laughs> I don't know. All of the people in green are our elementary school teachers. And we probably know that they don't have as much <clears throat> confidence in their science content, nor do they have the time or the inclination to do some of the kinds of things that are called for in these practices. They are really kind of concerned about everything. My daughter was an elementary school teacher. And they're concerned about math and English and science kind of gets stuck in. So that's a huge challenge to us as we implement this, is how are we going to get that 70 to 75 percent of the teachers of science to sign on and go through the effort that it's going to take to do this. All right, anybody want a shot at this one? It's even got labels. I like that. And I tried to make them big enough so you could see them. I found this to be very interesting. This is, by the way, many of us in this room are over here. This is the changing age demographic of educators in California. And if you'll notice, and it's true for across the country, there's a bump here of, we'll call these the young teachers, the early career teachers. And there are a whole bunch of us over here. Notice that the numbers go down. But the average career of a teacher in California and in the nation is about 30 years. People come into the profession at about 22, 23. And they usually stay until about 55 to 60. Now, I know I'm past that already. And so I'm planning to be here much longer. I want to get out all the way out to here, OK? Because uh, that means I'm still both well alive. All right. But the point is, we've got kind of this strange demographic. So using the magic of PowerPoint and the pen tool, I divided this up into kind of three components of the career. The interesting thing about these teachers, and this is a little bit more California-centric, the interesting thing about this group they have never, ever known inquiry science in school. In California, they entered school, and they were taught to memorize, and they were taught to know, and they were never taught to do. And so to take this group of teachers and say, here are the practices. Let's just go do them. They're looking at me going, I've never done them. I don't know what that is. And so this is a challenge for pre-service programs and in-service and professional development. How can we bring these people to a whole new understanding about the scientific practices and engineering practices that really form the foundation to the next generation of science? This is the next group. This is the group that has invested the last 17 years of their professional lives forgetting all the experiences they had in school and building robust, 
high scoring, high quality programs that score high on standardized exams, and they are heavily invested in that knowledge-based teaching. That is what they have worked very hard with, and they have in many, 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 many cases become very successful. And so when we say to them, great, you can keep doing that, but oh, by the way, we need to add in science and engineering practices, and we need to be doing and arguing and reading and, and doing all those things, they're saying, but when are we going to memorize? You know, we're really good doing this right now. Our students score well. They do, but they don't go into STEM career. And then there are the people like me who we live the science process approach. We live constructivism. We live inquiry science in our early careers. We were all behind that. In California, we lived the integrated science curriculum. And then we changed because the state said, now we're going to know. And so we had to relearn a new way of teaching and now we're asking them to unlearn that and relearn this. And so we have three distinct groups of people that we have to work with here that we have to figure out how to serve. And guess what? The same strategies are not going to work for all three of them. You've got one group that doesn't know, one group that's really happy with what they've got, and another group that you have to convince that it's worth the time and effort to spend the next five years, the last five years possibly of their careers, investing in doing something new. The good thing is that this group of people over here understand what this group of people don't know. And so we should be counting on this group of people to lead us through the implementation process. Oftentimes that's hard to get them to do because they're very comfortable in what they're doing. But we need them. We need you, those of you who fall at that end of the spectrum, we need to be involved in this process, and which is probably why we're here. So, what did I, so, so this is the question I'm asked most often, and I got here really early. I hope I match. I dressed in the dark at home at 4 o'clock before I drove down because I wanted to be attractive. And so I get asked this question all the time. The reason I said that it was I was going to get here early and write my article for the classroom science teacher, and this is the topic. This is what teachers ask me every time they see me and they know I've been involved with the development. It's great, we got, but what am I going to do tomorrow? California hasn't adopted yet. What am I going to do tomorrow? And I am telling them, work on the practices. This is the hard thing for teachers to do. It's the change that teachers and schools, it's the change that, that informals, it's the change that the community that you represent as well are going to be involved in. It's how do we incorporate the practices in our teaching. We know the content, or we can learn the content. We've demonstrated that over and over and over again. We all graduated from college, and that's what we did in college. We learned the content. And we all understand the cross-cutting concepts that they're in all the different content areas. But it's finding the time and developing the strategies to do those practices that the implementation is the, faces the largest challenge. So I'm back with my crystal ball. You got a little foggy. And I'd be glad to answer any questions. by performance, not by multiple choice, 
When you get the new science standards that are performance-based, then I fully expect you to support performance assessments. And my argument is we should not accept anything that does not include performance assessments. And as a community, we are the people that have to stand up. Already over and, and open it to uh, two questions, and we'll uh, open it up to the entire panel. So, um, Laura, and then I'll take the next one after. So, there's, there's a lot of folks in this room that have developed um, practice based curriculum. Um, we part with women for all science and other educators around the country, and um, there's a NASA wavelength site, and I've seen it, but um. I think the community that I've spoken with, myself included, we have teachers coming to our workshops who were involved in the framework, who were involved in writing the NG NGSS, and, uh, and they're saying this is exactly the kind of curriculum that we think aligns with the course standards and the NGSS. So I'm wondering, kind of, where, how do we take that momentum that I think a lot of us in this room have to tie into this implementation? I'm just wondering, for all three of you, how do you see this community really making that? What are our next steps? And do, do you see ways that, if you can help kind of maybe guide all our enthusiasm? Or, you know? <laughs> I, I was at the California presentation in front of the standards. I mean, I, I, I wasn't, I was in Washington, D.C., but I watched it on TV. Okay. I, um, and the thing that was really powerful there was, people got up and said, this is what we want. This is what we need. We have to, teachers are not real good advocates for themselves. We are advocates for our children. And now we have to be advocates for what we believe is the best thing to do. And we need to partner with business. We need to get as many, we, you know, if a teacher goes to the city council or to the legislator and says, my students do really well if they do this, the city council will go, thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Please sit down. If Boeing, if Northrop Grumman, if TRW, that's my son works with, most of those are my son one. If they go and say, look, we don't have anybody in California that can do the jobs we want, so we're going to take our industry and we're going to move out of town, the legislator will go, oh, sit down. Let's talk. So I think that one of the things that we have to do is no longer be passive. We have to stand up and say, if this is what we want, then we have to fight for it. There are plenty of people out there who will say, these are not good standards. This is not the way we should be going. You can read them just about anywhere. So if you don't agree with them, if you believe that this is the right direction, then you have to be vocal. You have to participate. And you have to get those people that you're with at. My own personal opinion. Did it check here, Glenn, want to add to that? I agree with what Rick said. Uh, it might be noted that as far as uh, industry is concerned, we did have uh, several we did have several people from industry involved in the uh, review process for the NGSS, and they had input into it. And their primary concern was exactly what Rick was saying, and that is, are our students in California prepared to be able to uh, pursue career activities, you know, in their particular industry, uh, based on the science preparation, you know, from K-12. So. Uh, we appreciated that input very much, and as noted, Appendix E, uh, which I had up there, also was used as a review by the NGSS uh, people, uh, not just in California, but through the other 26 states as well, to help uh, educators uh, in college as well as in careers uh, to take a look at the preparation that the students will have whenever they reach um, the 12th grade and are they career ready, or are they college ready and so forth. And that is a very, very important concern as well. So um, I think what you said, Rick, about all of us being invested in this and uh, taking a look at the positive aspects of what this will mean for not just our program, but for the state of California and for your state, wherever you're from, I think this is a very important uh, decision that we all make. And uh, Laura, I would say that, uh, and everyone, I would say that um, if you look at the whole ecosystem of education, 
And you're asking about materials developers and what role we can play in this, those of us who might have those materials. And I think that the, the biggest role we can play is to provide models of what it looks like and to raise the, um, uh, the level of discernment that schools and districts have for materials so that they start demanding materials that work and, and help them do that. So I think that there's a, there's a big role we can play in being visible, building that level of discernment, and, um, and creating those models. Okay, we'll take one more question. John. I'll dive in a little bit. I know that um, uh, what's different for science at elementary is the standards are grade by grade. Um, and that's how they are in math for K-12, that's how they are in English language arts, but we've never had that in science. We've had these kind of grade bands. There was a big argument about middle school, about whether at the NGSS to make it a, a grade band or grade by grade. And in the end, um, they decided to go grade ban because about half the states um, uh, have integrated programs, a little bit of each discipline each year in middle school, and about half of them don't. And they were going for maximum implementation, and so w what that meant is you can do it the way you want. And, um, and we know that it's really hard to tell high school teachers how to order it, too. So the same deal goes there. And I think the idea is that whatever the belief system is at your school, you can order that at the, the middle and high school level, which is how it's always been in science, and, and the big difference is at elementary. I think Glenn made the point early that this is not the curriculum. These are the standards. And that local decision is really something, that's the next step for local entities is decide how you're going to do this. Sorry. Yeah, it might be pointed out that as far as the uh, middle school curriculum, which was uh, a big hang-up for a lot of individuals, um, how that's going to be rolled out. Because we're going to be, uh, the emphasis it appears to be moving away from the traditional approach where you have earth science in sixth grade and life science in seventh grade and physical science in eighth grade. And it's a real big conceptual shift for people to see, well, how are we going to implement these standards whenever we have very specific uh, disciplines and domains we're working with. And um, I think what Rick pointed out is this, is that there's going to be discussion, you know, and that discussion is good. It's, it's healthy for people to go through because it helps them take a look at their own position and where they are, as well as what will be best for the students in their particular school. Um, we went through a similar discussion, uh, those who are on the review committee for the NGSS, uh, and there were several models for the middle school curriculum that were developed, and we, um, or progression, I don't mean curriculum, but progression, and, it, and we found that uh, across the state from the people who were represented in the committee that a different kind of an integrated approach would probably be best for six, seven, and eight. And, um, but that doesn't mean that that's what's going to happen. It just means that that was a, what we felt would be a workable model. And, and so every school district will have that decision to make. And that, and that was for California. That right. wasn't for Delaware or Rhode Island. Okay, I think we need to uh, close the session and let everyone move on to their next session. Thank you, everybody.